Good morning, Chicago. I'm Dr. Allison Arwady, Commissioner at the Chicago Department of Public Health. Today is Thursday, March 10th, 2022, and we are doing our regular COVID update. It's your opportunity to get your COVID questions answered directly. As always, you can put your questions directly into the box below. You can also use the hashtag AskDrRWD. We had CEO Martinez from Chicago Public Schools on on Tuesday, so we really had a focus on schools and children and masking. Uh, and today we're gonna try to get to some of the topics that we weren't able to get to in that context, but also make sure we have time uh, for your questions. So as always, let's start with how we are doing in Chicago. The news on COVID continues to be very, very good. Chai.gov slash COVID dash. Let's take a look. So still updating every day here and you see cases continue to drop. We're averaging just 141 cases uh, being diagnosed in, in labs across Chicago on a daily basis. That is down 30% from uh, a week ago and down to just five cases per 100,000 per day, really low. Um, we are seeing 13 Chicagoans get hospitalized each day with COVID-19. That also has continued to drop and you can see getting back down toward the lowest uh, place we've been. We're averaging two to three deaths a day, still coming off that Omicron surge, but that's been dropping nicely. Vaccines, unfortunately, are also down. Uh, we're averaging just about 2,400 a day uh, and also about 20, you know, 10 times that many tests, 24,000 tests on average per day and uh, a positivity rate of 0.7 percent uh, really remarkably low so let me pull up we've got some additional slides here just based on some questions that we were getting um, and just our, our, our regular updates so first of all um, a number of you wrote in about with concerns about Ukraine, people saying I live in Ukrainian village, what's available, et cetera. And so um, certainly, you know, war related trauma is very real and it is not just direct, but it can be indirect if people have uh, family members and loved ones um, worries uh, about the situation in Ukraine right now. There are some suggestions here. If you follow us on social, you've seen this, just you know, limiting some of the media exposure, so-called doom scrolling, thinking about ways to decrease stress, talking about it, uh, making sure the media you consume is credible, talking to children, choosing activities to restore control. And if you go to mentalhealth.chicago.gov, um, you can see some more specific resources related to that. So I just wanted to point people in that direction and certainly, um, you know, continue to be concerned about not just immediate, but but long term effects uh, on on health. And um, anytime you see war, there are always major both immediate and long term mental health and, and physical health uh, issues that tend to re result. Here's where we are in Chicago. Um, as you see, Everything remains in that lower transmission or even low in the case of positivity, uh, and everything continues to decrease. So even using the prior metrics before the CDC came out with its new guidance, we are low by every way you count. Um, and as a reminder, the CDC uh, COVID-19 community levels, which again are our CDC's approach to make sure there's a standardized way of looking at risk across the U.S. When levels are low in a county, it means there's a limited impact on the healthcare system, low levels of severe illness. When they're medium, some impact on the healthcare system, more people with severe illness. And when they're high, high potential for healthcare system strain, high level of severe illness. A lot of you have been writing in about masks and when might we, men might, might they come back, et cetera. You know, CDC's recommendation is uh, and, and CDPH would really be following this, that if and when we were to get back to a medium setting, we would likely be making recommendations around masking. We would be putting things in place in higher risk settings. And if we got to high, the CDC recommends that everybody be wearing masks in indoor uh, public settings. So um, hoping we won't see that again, but please know that we are following all those metrics. Um, and this uh, CDC is updating once a week. So we do expect to see the update today, uh, but this is from March 3, one week 
week ago. And you can see um, that a lot of the country now is looking green at low risk. Chicago, Cook County, Northern Illinois have been green all along, um, but we've been seeing improvements in areas around us. So that's good to see. And um, in terms of some specific numbers, uh, the highest daily case count we've had was over 10,000 cases in a single day in Chicago residents back on December 28, uh, and now averaging 141. That is the lowest that we've seen since July of 2021. Every day that's getting lower and we're getting close to the lowest ever. And what's important is that case count is the lowest it's been, even though more than three times the number of laboratory tests are being performed across Chicago as in July 2021. We know there are also many more at-home tests um, that are happening, but I want folks to understand that even as more at-home testing is occurring, um, we're testing so much more in that formal laboratory way than we were that it is to me really quite remarkable that the case rates are, are, are back as low as they were. Uh, positivity at 0.7% is almost breaking the record for lowest ever. Uh, June of 2021, we got down to 0.6% and uh, I'll be curious to see if, if we get there, but we're down from 20% just in January. Similarly, hospitalizations down from 300 in a single day among new Chicagoans getting hospitalized in a single day uh, down to 13. Most of those folks um, still are folks who are not up to date with their vaccinations, although we do see people certainly with immune, immune compromise or who are older um, sometimes still getting seriously ill. Hospital census is really good. Just, you know, we've got 16% of our beds available, non-ICU, that's beautiful, and 20% of the ICU that looks really good, continuing to drop each day. Um, we're at 76.9%, which, you know, our goal, 77% for all Chicagoans having gotten at least a first dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. If you limit it just to those who are eligible, those over five, uh, almost 82% have gotten a first dose, but um, that's, what the, that's what the graph is here. But uh, we are at just about that 77% of Chicagoans of all ages uh, with at least some protection via of vaccination. And we're at 61% now of black non-Latinx Chicagoans have had the first dose in purple. Uh, continuing to rise every day. It's where we're seeing the most improvement, but there is still the most room to grow. Uh, Latino Chicagoans now just as likely to have received at least one dose of COVID vaccine in blue there as white non-Latinx Chicagoans. And actually, if we limit it just to age eligible Chicagoans, meaning five and over, uh, Latinos are actually now more vaccinated than white Chicagoans, which is great um, in terms of thinking about which communities have been hit harder. Um, the seeing that that improvement in terms of vaccination rates meant that when Omicron was hitting, um, it was not hitting Latino Chicagoans uh, harder than it was um, predominantly Asian or predominantly white um, Chicago communities. Unfortunately, we did see for a number of reasons, including structural reasons, um, underlying conditions, et cetera, but the biggest one being really different vaccination rates. Uh, we did see the Omicron surge hit black Chicago really hard. Um, especially in terms of hospitalizations uh, and deaths. But we're making progress every day. Uh, by age here, we're up to 52% now of our 5 to 11 year olds have had a first dose compared to just 33% nationally. 81% uh, of our 12 to 17 year olds compared to just 68% nationally. So every day, good progress there. And we continue to be really focused on schools and on youth, not just for the kids, but for their families. Um, hope you're starting to see some of these signs around. I am. Uh, just a reminder that anywhere where you are in, in Chicago, if you're in a business, if you're in a religious setting, if you're gathering, um, please feel free to download these and print them. They're available. Uh, we're really trying to emphasize this being kind, that you're going to see people wearing masks, that if you are experiencing potential COVID symptoms, we want you wearing a mask, uh, and that there remain settings where vaccination cards may be required or masks or vaccination um, cards or there are there are establishments still requiring masking the city does not require it but we are in support of um, businesses that that make that decision um, the risk is low and continuing to drop but especially if you're um, a setting that is serving um, you know people who with immunocompromised have a lot of older people etc um, you will probably see these signs and we encourage you to download them and use them 
Uh, where are we now? So we are, we, we're getting a lot of questions along this line. So here, here's how I'm really thinking about this. We are in a new phase of this pandemic, not just because we're post Omicron, but because vaccines, boosters, and tests are widely available because effective treatments have now been developed. Those early treatments that the Paxlovid, for example, which is the one that Pfizer made, dropped the risk if people did get COVID and they were higher risk, they were older, having underlying conditions, dropped the risk of getting hospitalized by 89%. So this is why we want folks who are higher risk, whether they're vaccinated or not, if they get COVID, we want them talking to their doctor so that they can access some of these new treatments, which can help prevent severe illness. And then importantly, the very large majority of Chicagoans have some immunity because they've been vaccinated. You know, at least 77% of Chicagoans have at least some protection through vaccination. And we estimate um, well over 90% if we combine people who have been vaccinated or pre previously infected. And although we've talked about this a lot, the best protection are people who have both are up to date with vaccination, including a booster, and they've recovered from COVID. The next best level of protection are people who are up to date with vaccination, but have not had COVID. Um, and uh, the next would be people who have had COVID, but have not been vaccinated. And if there are still folks out there who have neither recovered from COVID nor been vaccinated, I'm just very concerned about outcomes, but we think those level, we think those numbers are quite low uh, and where they exist, they do tend to be in the younger children who are less likely to have severe outcomes. Um, but, but really our ability to prevent or reduce severe illness between first and foremost vaccination and secondly, um, treatments makes it less critical to focus on stopping every case of COVID-19. Plus we're not going to, eradicate COVID without some new breakthrough. And so as the virus continues to circulate, we have to make sure we don't overwhelm hospital and healthcare systems because overwhelmed hospitals can't provide the best care for COVID patients or everybody else who needs healthcare. Um, and we can't let emergency departments get overwhelmed, which makes people wait for life-saving care, has these indirect effects. And so we are looking at severe cases, and so is CDC, that require hospital care and use healthcare resources, both because those are the outcomes we're really working hard to prevent uh, and because we have to make sure we don't have that secondary outcome of overwhelming the health system. So that, that's important while we continue to follow cases and positivity, et cetera, um, where we think about moving forward, when do we especially need to make sure we're putting mitigations in place? Um, we want to think about all the impacts COVID has in our communities. Around early treatments, uh, somebody on Tuesday said we never talk about treatments, so I thought I would put in again uh, the slide that we've been using for months now, um, but we'll just let me just talk right through it. If you test positive for COVID-19, there are IV and oral medications that can help keep you out of the hospital, but they need to be taken in the first few days of infection. Many of them work by stopping the virus from copying itself. So they don't stop you from getting infected, but they stop it from over, they help to stop it from overwhelming your body, making you really sick, getting into your lungs, your other organs, uh, and putting you in the hospital. But it's too late to take the ones that stop the virus from copying once the virus has copied and you're already really sick. So if you test positive and you have underlying conditions that put you at high risk for hospitalization, talk with your health care provider immediately to see if they recommend these newer treatments that are not that are now available. The treatments are not for everybody. Um, they can interact with other medications some people are taking. You may need to get some lab work. So you can't just go in and get these off the shelf at the pharmacy. They need to be prescribed by a healthcare provider. You can't just walk into a pharmacy. You can't just go to an IV infusion center without a prescription. Um, and supply is growing. It's been a little bit limited, but I'll tell you here in Chicago, we have these available. The larger challenge has been making sure people are reaching out when they're first diagnosed or, or when their symptoms start, making sure they get tested. And at the federal level too, there's a real goal, and we were already working on this in Chicago, but tying positive tests to making sure people, um, especially higher risk people, are getting connected to the care and especially to these treatments. So if you call us, you go to the website, you'll see um, information and we can help get you connected. But our federally qualified health centers in particular, which serve 
a lot of people who may be less connected to care, um, people who may be uninsured, underinsured, um, un uh, undocumented, et cetera, um, provide care on a sliding scale all the way down to zero. We've worked hard to make sure that those settings are prioritized, not just for testing and PPE, et cetera, but, but for make sure that the providers there um, know how to connect folks to treatment. So there are no cost, they're available, reach out and uh, help us help you stay out of the hospital. I also wanted to remind folks that there are free at-home COVID-19 tests, um, and every home in the U.S. is eligible to order now two sets of the four free at-home tests. So if you already ordered your first set, you can go ahead and order a second set today. Um, I ordered mine, I got them. They actually did a pretty nice job of prioritizing zip codes where um, COVID had hit harder, where we knew economic level levels might have been lower. Um, I wasn't sure how well they do with that on this national distribution but they did well with it here in Chicago so um, those of you who live in harder hit zip codes with more barriers actually got your tests earlier than people who live in zip codes that that, that we've seen more testing access uh, but regardless everybody is eligible they are free so order your second set if you haven't and if you haven't ordered your first set order both your sets go to covidtest.gov all you do is you put in your contact and shipping information. You don't have to put in anything else. They're not gonna ask you for your insurance. They're not gonna ask you for um, your identification. It's through the US Postal Service. Um, and if you don't have internet, you can call 1-800-232-0233. Um, and there will be tests coming to your door. I also wanted to just remind everybody that if you catch COVID-19, nothing has changed around isolation. Also, nothing has changed around quarantine. So regardless of your vaccination status, if you test positive for COVID, you must stay home for five days. If your symptoms are better, you're feeling good by day five, you can leave your house, but you must continue to mask while around others for days six through 10 in public spaces. So uh, if you've got questions, as always, reach out, but it doesn't matter if you're vaccinated, it doesn't matter whether we're talking school, work, out in general, nothing has changed. You must stay home for days one through five, and you must mask in public spaces no matter what that public space is in days six through 10. And if you've got more questions about that, please do let us know. I also just wanted to remind people about COVID boosters. Uh, the data on these is good. We can talk some more as necessary, but the WHO has just really said, okay, like we're, we got to do this across the world too, because it's clear that getting that booster uh, does give additional protection, not just for antibodies, but in a longer term way. Uh, so anyone over the age of 12 should be getting boosted five months after your initial Pfizer or Moderna series, or two months after your initial J&J &J vaccination. And then finally, the our Protect Chicago at Home program still going strong. It is. It has been. It's one of the most innovative programs we've done here in Chicago. We continue to see actually black Chicagoans be the most likely to choose this route to get vaccinated. And given that that's where we're still um, needing to work the most as a city, we have not pulled back on this at all yet. We have appointments Monday through Sunday, 8 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. Uh, there are $50 incentives that come with your first dose or your second dose, and uh, up to 10 people can get vaccinated at one time. Anybody over the age of five in the entire city of Chicago, no questions asked. We'd love to bring vaccine to you at, at a time that is convenient. Um, so give us a call. As always, 312-746-4835. If you're looking for a vaccine or booster, um, reach out. All right, let's get into some of your questions. All right. Um, we've got a question about the, the Transportation Security Administration extending the uh, federal public transportation mass mandate. So let's talk about that. So that's new news just today. Um, so the TSA, which remember is who checks 
when you're going through airports, et cetera, um, is part of ensuring security there, but works with CDC and others um, around thinking about public transportation broadly in the US. Uh, and there has been a decision to extend that from the middle of March to the middle of April. So that continues to apply in the city of Chicago. If you are on public transportation, the L, the Metro, the bus, public transportation, you need to wear a mask. That's a federal requirement and it will be in place. Um, it is one of the last broad requirements in the US, uh, but there's a number of reasons for it. And I just wanted to say that I do think that it, it does make sense. Yes, we are low risk here in Chicago. Um, however, there remain parts of the state, definitely the country, and definitely the world that are not in good COVID control right now. We're a global city and the the L and public transportation in general remains one of the places that you are most likely to potentially be in close contact with people that you don't know anything about, right? You don't know if they're vaccinated. You don't know what their, what their risks um, may be. And then when we take that to things like assigned seats on you know, trains or buses uh, or airplanes, you actually are in close proximity potentially for a long period of time. And so recognizing that it's one of the settings where, um, you know, although risk is very low, of course, here in Chicago, let me tell you that there are parts of the world that are still very much in the throes of their Omicron surge. Um, a lot of Asia still has very high rates. Germany has really high rates again right now, number of European countries. And um, I think that, that public transportation generally um, is something that we want to make sure everybody feels comfortable um, using, uh, really committed to public transportation, and, and the masks, therefore, do remain in place. And um, per the announcement this morning, they will remain in place through the middle of April, um, and that will be reassessed at the federal level. So let us know if you have other questions, but uh, that does remain in place. Another question here about what's happening uh, sort of across the U.S. a little more broadly. And um, we are continuing to update the travel advisories. We shared that on Tuesday. But I actually think those CDC metrics at the county level um, are also really useful. So if you, if you were looking at that, and I would encourage you to, to look at that, you can find it on the CDC site. We're linking to it on our site. You'll see that Idaho and Montana, as well as Appalachia, and actually Maine has been having a little bit of trouble. Those are probably the main areas that, that kind of as a region are, are still surging a fair bit. But overall, every single state is seeing good improvements. And even the ones that are still red and higher risk are seeing improvements. So uh, cases are down really nicely across the US. And in that setting, uh, there's an important milestone um, coming up. Hawaii is going to be the last state that at the moment is planning to lift its indoor mask requirement on, I believe it's March 26, the end of March. and. Puerto Rico is, I, I believe today was, was their day. Still some of the other territories, Guam, et cetera, um, have some of that in place. But we've been seeing, you know, as states have seen improvements, dropping that. And at the moment, Hawaii uh, is planning to be the last um, on March 26. Hawaii, of course, as an island, a lot of travelers has needed to have some stricter requirements um, in, in place there. And uh, so really, you know, good news across across the US and we're keeping a close eye on variants, BA2, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, but the news is good, the risk is not gone. Um, and it's not quite as good as it is here in Chicago in some places, but really pleased to see improvements everywhere. All right, a um, couple of questions that, that I didn't get to earlier uh, that, I, that I do want to address. So Alexandria Deanne on Facebook was asking about, about uh, deer. She says, I saw a study that showed a new variant spreading in deer. Could it be transmitted to humans? Are there concerned this could be a bigger deal? So Alexandria, we've been following pretty closely what hap what's, what we've seen in um, what we call zoonotic, uh, you know, COVID, meaning COVID that we see in animals. And we have definitely seen animals 
uh, both domesticated and wild animals be reservoirs for COVID. Now, what does that mean? That means, first and foremost, that we are highly unlikely to eradicate COVID-19. One of the biggest predictors of whether humans can eradicate a disease is whether there are animal reservoirs because while it can continue to live in animals, particularly if it doesn't make those animals sick, which it doesn't seem to do in deer, uh, generally, you can't, you know, you're unable to think about how do you eradicate sort of across all species at all times. So vet veterinarians have been a big part of COVID studies and response all along. White-tailed deer early on we knew were able to be reservoirs for COVID and Back a while ago, I think, I want to say like late 2020, early 2021, there were studies done in white-tailed deer where they swabbed deer that, you know, got hit by trucks or were killed by hunters. They weren't dying from COVID, uh, but they were swabbing them and doing PCR testing and finding very high rates of COVID, like 30% among deer that were killed for other areas. And that was replicated, I think, in Pennsylvania and, you know, a number of different places. And so, there was knowledge that deer are a reservoir, that clearly there's transmission among deer. So that raises, you know, this is when we started really being, you know, talking realistically, this is going to be endemic at some level. We're not likely to eradicate it. And so then you're interested in, are animals likely to transmit this between uh, humans and, and, and animals? And this is where, you know, we've, we've been answering questions about cats and dogs on here for all of COVID. And uh, we do know that cats and dogs are able to be infected with COVID, uh, but they, they are unlikely to get seriously ill. They also seem to be very unlikely to transmit back to humans. So, you know, just as a reminder, um, we do recommend that if somebody has COVID at home, uh, an, a human, I mean, that if you can have somebody else, you know, in especially those first few days, you know, feed the dog or the cat, um, you know, that can help limit it. But there's no need otherwise to be isolating your animals, highly worried about it, meaning the ones at home. Mink were a major concern. Uh, that was in Scandinavia, I want to say Denmark, um, because in some of the mink farms there, not only were they seeing a lot of mutations, but they were seeing quite a bit of transmission to humans uh, and, and there was some mink culling. We've not seen concerns with chickens. We've not seen concerns with other birds uh, by and large. And I think What's been interesting, and I'm not sure exactly which recent study you're referring to, but I'm just sort of doing a run through of some of the ones I've been reading. Number one is they've seen in deer relatively recently that they've continued to have some of the older versions of COVID, not so much the Omicron, which has been interesting because, of course, in humans, Omicron is... Uh, virtually everything we're seeing at this point. Um, those of you who are on Tuesday, we shared the updated data. We're across the whole Midwest. Everything is Omicron. 99.999% of Omicron of the, of what we're of what we're doing testing on is is Omicron, and then the great majority of that, somewhere around 94, 95%, is still the original Omicron BA1, and then we're seeing about 6% of the BA2. But what they're seeing in deer is older strains and not seeing Omicron sort of as clearly have gotten in there and out competing. And that is a little bit worrisome to me, I will tell you, because it means that you have the potential in these animal reservoirs to maybe have some new combinations. On the plus side, uh, where the veterinarians have been studying this all along, They've not seen concerns of these, if they are seeing some additional mutations, et cetera, they've not seen those spreading. They've not seen those um, clearly moving to humans. There, there is, you know, as you know, it, it looks like there's, there may have been sort of one case study of potential transmission there and folks are looking at it. But overall, I would say um, we're still learning about animal reservoirs, the animals that people tend to be in contact with on a regular basis um, do not seem to be significant concerns. Uh, and I think in some of these wild animal populations like deer, the veterinarians are still very much um, studying this, but there has not been major alarm there. Um, but it is something that, that we continue to follow. From my standpoint, 
you know, this is why it is important that as we develop the ability, you know, we're, we're good at this point. We're, we're looking at human samples everywhere of COVID. Similar work is happening on the veterinary side, and it will need to, and it will need to grow uh, to make sure that, that we're also following what's happening there. It's really common for animals, actually, to have versions of human diseases that don't make them sick and don't necessarily transmit. Um, but where we see uh, animal to human um, interactions, that can be a risk for new strains, new variants. Uh, we especially think about that in flu. So um, yeah, that's what I would say about it. I don't have a major level of concern, but uh, that is what I, what I can tell you about what we're watching uh, here. Uh, we don't have a lot of white-tailed deer running around and, and uh, you know, in downtown Chicago, but there are a lot in the area. Okay. Um, let's take a number of the, let's just talk a little bit about long COVID. We've got questions here from Vicki Trinidad on Facebook. I've noticed when more sound data is gathered, there are long-term effects from COVID-19 that have occurred. Can they become permanent? Um, let's talk, Mary Rodriguez from Facebook says, does it seem like COVID causes other chronic conditions like in a long COVID way? Um, she says, my spouse works in a nursing home, has seen new incidents of stroke-like effects. People who might have chronic lower oxygen after COVID have seen hair loss, arthritis. I've had friends and clients newly diagnosed with cancer. Is this correlated with increased stress on the body from a COVID infection? Or does the coronavirus actually cause the body to contract other chronic conditions? Um, and then, and then um, and one more question here. Will some people experience lingering cough after they've had COVID? Is it considered a sign of long COVID, what should we know about this? So similarly, let's just, those are all really good questions. Let me talk just very high level about long COVID. Um, the people are calling this different things. So long COVID is the term that people are, many, many of you are using. The CDC, as we've been working to kind of understand this, uh, is, is using a more general term uh, just called post-COVID conditions, PCC, uh, because we've seen a mix of presentations and we are still very much learning about this. Uh, let me kind of just high level hit on some of the questions folks are asking as well as maybe a few you didn't, but just to let you know what, what we see. So first of all, the great majority of people who recover from COVID do not have long-term effects, thankfully. We also know that the best way to prevent post-COVID conditions, long COVID, is to not get infected with COVID at all, obviously. And so, one of the reasons we certainly promote vaccination is that is by far the safest way to get immune, um, to, you know, to get some immune protection against COVID-19 without running all of the risks that come both with acute COVID infection as well as, you know, potentially the risk of uh, a post-COVID syndrome of some kind. We have seen, um, You'll see people talk about long haul COVID, post acute COVID, chronic COVID, and there are big studies that are going on nationally to really understand this better. It's been one of the priorities. I was on a really interesting call with some of the scientists at CDC earlier this week talking about uh, where as a country are we doubling down? Where are the questions? Where are we still, where are there still a lot of unanswered questions that public health and clinical medicine need to work together to answer? And certainly this is one of the most important pieces. And so in the same way that there were really robust systems set up kind of post Zika infection to study those, um, you know, it's how we know about long-term effects of measles. That is very much happening with COVID. There are clinical settings all over the country that are studying this. But there are also some big studies uh, collecting data in very standardized ways. Um, it does look like people who were more severely ill, were, were infected earlier, especially pre-vaccine, um, who had higher levels of COVID in their blood. Those seem to be risk factors for developing it, but then we see people develop um, certainly who don't also meet those. So one of, to me, the most important, there's been a couple of really good studies out just in the last couple of months that I've talked about um, as they've come out in some of the basic science journals. There was one in Nature, 
Um, there's one I just pulled from Cell. Uh, there's a journal called Cell. The lead author on it, last name is Sue, S-U. This one came out just in January, and it, it was really, it's this work to say, how do we know who's at higher risk for developing these syndromes? Um, it's pretty common, for example, if people lose taste and smell, that that might not come back for months, but it typically does come back. But if it doesn't come back, what does that mean? Um, but then, in addition to losing the taste and smell, here, let me just give you a sense of the range of some of what we hear. Most common, and I have even seen patients in clinic myself um, who come in saying, you know, I had COVID way back in the past, but I've just never felt like I totally got my breath back after that. I've just, I feel more short of breath. I feel more tired. It's this nondescript fatigue slash kind of some ongoing shortness of breath, especially if they, got, if they were seriously ill. Um, but we also hear people talking about sort of a brain fog, difficulty concentrating. Um, uh, we hear about people reporting coughs that really go on and on. It's common after you recover from a virus to have a cough that can go on uh, for weeks. That is, a real, that is not at all uncommon. But we're talking months here is really, is really what we mean. And um, the actual definition is about symptoms that go on for four or more weeks. So. We don't consider it long COVID if somebody gets diagnosed with COVID and for two, three, four weeks later, they're still recovering. Really, that's differentiating from something else seems to be going on um, for more than four weeks. And we've heard about joint and muscle pain. We've heard about um, diarrhea and sleep problems, even some fevers, dizziness, rash, mood changes, those smells and changes in smell or taste, et cetera. It is rare for people to have serious new diagnoses though. And so to Mary's question, does it seem like COVID is making people get diagnosed with aggressive cancers? No, I've not seen anything that suggests that. Um, does it seem that they are developing new conditions? Not really, it's more like post COVID, their immune system has been activated in such a way that they are, uh, that they, that they are having real changes. Like it's not that these are not real, but it's not so much that it's a new disease. I think we're still looking at diabetes. Diabetes of course is very common. There are immune relationships to diabetes and a number of studies now have shown that people who have diabetes are statistically, and they get COVID, are statistically more likely to have some of those long COVID symptoms than people who do not have diabetes. We don't know yet though, if that is just confounding factors. People who have diabetes also statistically are more likely to be overweight, to be on more medications, to have other underlying conditions, to have heart disease. But that does, that does seem to be, it's come out in a couple of studies now, um, at least somewhat of an independent risk factor. We also know there are certain antibodies, the scientists, because what would be great is if you could do a blood test, right? Right when someone's uh, diagnosed or even if they're even ahead of time and say, oh, you know, you're somebody who we might be more concerned about long COVID in. We want to be extra sure you're up to date with your vaccinations, you're being careful. There's some early science that suggests, for example, there are these anti-autobodies, um, I'm sorry, autoantibodies that some people can develop um, where you've heard about autoimmune diseases. It seems like there may be some correlation, but we're still learning about it. You can't really count on any of this yet. There's not studies. People who had Epstein-Barr virus, uh, which is a very common virus, um, also seem that that seems like there may be some link where people who have had that and recovered may be more likely um, to have the post-COVID uh, sy syndrome. But clearly, the ability to reactivate viruses you had in the past seem to also be a part of this. So I know that's not the most satisfying answer, but I, I want to be honest with you that we are still learning about this. Um, and so just to come back to the questions that got asked, you know, is lingering cough after COVID a potential sign of long COVID? Only if it goes on for more than four weeks. Um, uh, on the question of, you know, could these long-term effects become permanent? We don't know. There are certainly people who continue to have effects that seem to have started from when they first got COVID that have been going on at this point for more than a year. 
There are, though, also plenty of people who had long COVID symptoms that went on for months and actually have fully recovered. Uh, interestingly, vaccination turned out to be something that for some people who had long COVID after early infections, getting vaccinated actually helped cure their long COVID, which was not something scientists were expected to see. And it was not universal. But again, we know this is something about your immune system and probably what viruses you may have seen before. And, and the symptoms are not COVID still in your body, but they're probably a, you know, is it an overactive immune response that sort of continues on similar to, you you know, some of the other um, immune diseases we're, st we're still learning about. And then finally, for the question in the nursing home, where you've seen people have more oxygen needs, um, arthritis, et cetera, those can be the oxygen needs. Definitely, if somebody, especially if they're in a nursing home um, and you've done real damage to the lungs, like COVID, in if, if it really gets into folks lungs and is causing serious COVID pneumonia like that's a big deal it can obviously kill people but it can also cause even permanent damage if you remember early on um, you know Northwestern was one of the first places in the country that even did some lung transplants for people young people uh, who got COVID infection because their lungs could not recover um, even after they had long since cleared the virus so it wouldn't surprise me to see somebody who had COPD or something else, or, or even somebody who got seriously ill with COVID uh, having more oxygen requirement. I think things like hair loss come at a time of great stress to the body. That is not COVID specific. We see that whenever people get, get sick, especially sick enough to be hospitalized. Um, the arthritis is interesting. And you know, again, the joint pains, what, what, what is that? Especially if there's an inflammatory component, you might see that. But I don't think new cancer is related. We've not seen that that's related. Um, and uh, we've not seen the coronavirus make people more likely to have chronic conditions, perhaps with the exception of diabetes again. Uh, a little bit of link in kids with diabetes. So I think the jury's out on diabetes, but other than that, we haven't, we haven't really seen um, anything too obvious. Okay, Kristen Korkowski on Facebook is asking, is BA2 going to impact, impact us severely? So I sort of doubt it at this point. We've seen BA2, which is the subvariant of Omicron, um, be increasing here over a number of weeks now without taking off in the way the original Omicron variant did. There was also good news out of um, Qatar, or Qatar, I think it's Qatar you pronounce it, uh, that did a really nice study that helped answer, you know, we were worried if people were infected with Omicron BA1, were they gonna get infected again potentially with Omicron BA2? And at least in this good study that they did in the Middle East, um, that didn't seem like it was happening. So that's reassuring. There are certainly a number of countries where BA2 is predominant. Um, so China and India and Bangladesh, um, I think even some of the European countries. And we have seen, you know, those are some of the countries that are very much still in their surge, but they didn't get down to the low levels that we did here. So as you know, generally when we're at lower levels, we can tolerate you know, we don't see those major problems um, because the risk is lower when there is just less COVID circulating. So I'm certainly keeping an eye on it. You know, is it possible if this continues to outcompete, we could see um, some increase? We could, but the good news is as BA2 has been going up, our COVID situation has been going down. And that is what we saw in many other countries too. Um, we didn't see it in all countries, but it's what we've seen in many other countries and nothing suggests major problems here, although we're keeping an eye on it. Okay. Um, All right, so there's a number of folks here even going back and forth about um, what is in vaccines. So, oh, and this is, a, okay, so Rachel Edwards is talking about, um, Rachel Edwards is talking about someone who hadn't been vaccinated and why not? She says, someone recently told me they won't get the vaccine because it has heavy metals in it and that is unhealthy for us. They also seem very concerned that Moderna had a patent on the vaccine for COVID-19 almost four years ago. I think implying it's a conspiracy driven by pharmaceutical profits or something. I told them that was probably a treatment for other forms of coronavirus that existed before, but I was hoping you could address these two concerns more thoroughly. Great, yes, happy to do 
both of that. Michelle Lynn on Facebook says, the CDC released information letting people know the vaccine has HIV-like proteins in it. Why are you pushing it with this inf info? And then I see Connor saying, I asked the doctor that specific question and she told me it was misinformation when the vaccine company stated it themselves. So let's address all of this. So thank you. And before I get into those various pieces of misinformation, let me just comment that I really like it when you are asking people who are not vaccinated, why not? Hearing from them and then looking for information about it. Um, I was at, I'm just gonna tell a personal story real quick. Um, some of you know that all along through COVID, for the last two years, not the last two years, the last, since there was a vaccine, the last year plus, um, you know, people recognize me on the street and on the L and out and about in Chicago all the time. This is very strange for me. This was never a goal of mine, um, but it happens. And so my always, like what I say back right away is, you know, they'll be like, oh, aren't you, you know, the doctor on TV, the ID, you know, whatever it is. I'm like, yes, I'm the health commissioner. Um, and I always say, are you vaccinated? That is just my default, like, that's what I'm interested in. And I've had so many interesting conversations with people, uh, most of the time, of course, especially, frankly, if they recognize who I am and are willing to say that, usually they're vaccinated. But you'd be surprised how many people actually are like, no, I'm not. And then, you know, this conversation of why not, what does that look like, um, those, I remain completely so interested in people who have not yet chosen to get vaccinated. But I'm even more interested in people who get vaccinated now, right, who didn't get vaccinated for a whole year plus and are now making that choice. And so I was at Mercy, uh, the old Mercy, uh, which is now Insight Medical Center um, on Monday. They were celebrating opening their emergency department. Really exciting to see uh, that medical center coming back in Bronzeville, really committed to working on health disparities. All a really, really good event. Um, but on the way out, as often happens, um, you know, somebody said, oh, you know, aren't you that COVID, that, the CDC doctor, whatever. Um, and I said, yes, you know, nice, nice to meet you. Are you vaccinated? Um, and he said, yes. And I said, oh, great. You know, are you boosted? This was an older uh, black gentleman. And I could see he was older. So I'm especially interested in making sure um, he's boosted. And he was like, oh, no, they told me they told me like not to get a boost. I was like, what do you mean they told you not to get a booster? And he's like, no, they they said I should get a booster in like July. And I was like, you know, and then he pulls out his card and he's just gotten vaccinated, like with the dates, you know? And I was like, oh, you just got vaccinated. So you're right, you don't need a booster just yet, but you know, you should get one in, you know, five months or whatever. Um, and I was like, can I ask, like, what made you, you know, I'm really glad you got vaccinated. What made you get to get vaccinated now? And he said, well, you know, I was reading a lot about this. Um, I was reading what Louis Farrakhan was saying, who was really against vaccines. Um, and I was really worried that, that I, you know, he didn't say the word trust, but he was like, I just, it was new. I wasn't sure about it. He's like, but look, I get a flu shot every single year because my doctor tells me to. And I was like, oh, good for you. And he said, and I was in, uh, he said, I have diabetes. I'm, I mean, he was in his late sixties, I think mid sixties. And he said, my doctor said to me, you know, you really need to get this COVID vaccine. And he's like, I thought about it. And I thought about all the people I know who've gotten vaccinated and I said, yeah, you know, now's the time. And that is how most people in this city feel about vaccination. Most of them are not against it. They're just not too sure. And they've been reading things that have made them question it. And so I love it when you're either asking questions yourself um, or wanting to know how to answer these kinds of questions. So that's just a backdrop, but um, every single day, people are getting vaccinated for the first time here in the city of Chicago. We are not done and we are still at it. Uh, so to, Rachel, to your question. So there are no heavy metals in any of the COVID-19 vaccines, full stop. Um, and you can look at the inserts. Um, sometimes when people are talking about heavy metals, usually, just so you have the background on that, that gets back to the very old days where they used to use mercury as a preservative um, in some old vaccines that were not COVID vaccines. We don't do that at all. Uh, there actually are not even preservatives, thimerosal, none of that 
in any of the COVID-19 vaccines. Um, and so there's information on the CDC website and others, but, but, but there are not heavy metals, but that's probably what they're hearing. Relating to Moderna, nobody had a patent for a COVID-19 vaccine um, before the COVID-19 outbreak. But as you note, um, there had been work on coronavirus vaccines for years before COVID-19. Remember, two of the big worldwide attention outbreaks that have happened in the last you know, 15, 20 years were other coronaviruses. So in like 2003, that was when um, SARS, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, that was a coronavirus. Uh, and if you remember, it was in Asia and then it was in Toronto and it was a big deal and people died, but it was able to be contained. It was not that infectious, but, but it was a huge deal at the time because whenever we see, and that was a new coronavirus, right? MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. Um, I was working for the CDC when MERS emerged and I was able to be um, part of the team on the ground in the Middle East that what uh, in Saudi Arabia that was studying this new coronavirus uh, that we knew was more infectious it seemed than SARS was more both SARS and MERS much more deadly if you got infected but harder to get infected and so you know I was part of studies interviewing family members and then testing them and working to see who got infected and who didn't? What were the risk factors for infection? I had veterinary colleagues, you know, studying camels on the same team. Like the work of sort of studying coronaviruses has been going on for decades. Um, and in both cases, SARS and MERS, they never turned into something that needed that widespread vaccination. Um, but, but there has been a lot of work around uh, vaccinations and, and the mRNA vaccines, Moderna and Pfizer are both mRNA vaccines. And that is technology that ha there had been studies, you know, working up toward this for about 20 years. Um, but this was the first actual mRNA vaccine. So I hope that helps clarify, um, have pharmaceuticals made money off COVID vaccines? They have. Am I extraordinarily grateful that we have the scientific processes and companies and abilities to create those vaccines in this country as quickly and well and to have an amazing vaccine? Yes. And am I extremely grateful and pleased that there was a decision at the federal government level to say, we are going to bear the cost of this for all Americans, right? So the federal government has the contracts with the pharmaceutical companies. Did they make some money? Yes, they did. Is that how scientific research, because a lot of other companies also worked on vaccine development that they didn't turn out to be successful vaccines, right? Their safety, their efficacy in the studies, they weren't, you know, Merck did a huge thing and it, their vaccine just didn't work very well. It never comes to market. You know, they are then out potentially millions or billions of dollars. So that is part of the way that vaccine development works. But, but Moderna in particular actually was developed at the NIH. Um, so by the US government and then, you know, production is done in, in conjunction with others. So, um, yeah, so I hope that helps clarify it. And Michelle and Connor, there is no HIV of any kind in any of the COVID vaccines. I'm not sure what you mean by HIV-like protein. Um, I'm not sure if that's getting, and, and, and there is zero risk, zero that you could get infected with HIV, that in any way getting the COVID virus inter interface, like, I mean the, the COVID vaccine interfaces with it, nothing. I think there's a couple of things you may be hearing or sort of perhaps getting a little confused around. So let me sort of talk through those. This is just a guess, because I don't know exactly what you're reading. Please send in what you're reading, so because I can address it directly. You might be thinking about how the new treatments that are available um, one of them has, um, ritonavir, has uh, something that can help 
sustain, that can help make HIV treatments last longer uh, for people who are infected with HIV and they take a drug. One of those has that same boosting with ritonavir, but that is nothing to do with HIV specifically. It's about making sure that your the right level of the treatment is actually in your body extended. It does not have HIV in it. It does not cause it. But remember how I said that you need to get a prescription from a doctor or a you know another prescriber to be able to get the treatments. It's because if you are somebody who are taking our amazingly effective medications for HIV and the type of medication that you are taking has this ritonavir in it, you shouldn't take the, the type of COVID treatment because there could be an interaction. So maybe you're hearing something related to that. But on vaccines, no, no link to HIV, and please send me whatever it is that you are reading, um, and I hope that that helps clarify uh, both of those. So, okay, we are at time. Um, I know today I, I sort of took a, a little bit fewer questions and went a little bit more in depth on some of them, but uh, we hadn't had as much time to go into some of what is happening in the science space. Um, and so, um, I see Boo Humes on Facebook just with a follow-up. It's a minute amount. It's not legally required. Metals do not get filtered. Don't believe. Do your research. Please do your research, but why don't you start with the uh, package inserts, which is what is regulatory required. And if you've got questions, please come back. Um, uh, and again, always, I think, misinformation starts from something that was true in the past or that has some grain of truth, right? Like the fact that people with HIV, there are certain treatments for COVID that they shouldn't take because there can be drug interactions, right? So is that something that potentially people could then take and run with and get confused about and turn into something? They could. Um, but doing your own research, like my job is to do the research on this, if you know what I'm saying, and, and so is my team's. Um, and the safety is on, the, on these vaccines is excellent, and there's a whole reason we don't use um, those, those heavy metals uh, in the U.S., right, um, and, and not in the COVID vaccines. And, and I, I'm not going to get into that further today, but one of the great things about the mRNA vaccines, I know we're at time, one of the great things about the mRNA vaccines is that they actually don't hang around for a long time. They are only teaching your own cell how to produce the immune um, response in case you see COVID for real. And so you don't need the preservatives that we needed for some of those old ones. It's, it's actually the hardest part to solve was not the mRNA. It was suspending it in the fat globule that keeps it stable enough so it can get in and teach your immune system lessons. So the whole point is the vaccines don't hang around and they don't need the preservatives. That's part of why we had that ultra cold. And, you know, there were a lot of complications around getting this vaccine out because they were not using um, some of those preservatives. So it is that is the truth, um, and I would encourage you, as you quote, do your own research to make sure you're uh, doing that research, um, you know, in reputable from reputable sources. So thank you, and uh, we will be back next Tuesday to get some more of your questions answered. Have a good weekend.